welcome back to Zero Entry. Uh, this is episode two, links below to episode one if you want to review how we started. Uh, and as promised, uh, this episode is about Software Eats the World, uh, which is a article written by Mark Andreessen in August 2011 for the Wall Street Journal. And in fact, what we're really going to be asking this episode is, will software eat mining? Here is the article itself. Uh, a, a copy of it can be found on the Andreessen Horowitz website. Andreessen Horowitz is a venture capital firm in Silicon Valley, uh, co-founded by Mark Andreessen, currently has 12 billion under funds. Uh, it's a fabulous resource for those people who are wanting to know all things new technology. The original concept of uh, Software Eats the World has been an incredibly powerful uh, influence on business thinking and technology business thinking. Uh, just to illustrate, here's a recent example uh, from Forbes uh, magazine uh, building on the fundamental premise. I, I, I'm not going to go into it uh, in this particular what this article is saying, I'm just showing you there as an illustration. Um, just Google and you'll find plenty of examples. So let's look at how, uh, what the article actually said and this is a summary. He basically said that one by one industries would be transformed by software. Okay, not that amazing a claim, even at the time. But what was different was the morphology, the process by which that change comes about and what you have to look for. And he starts with the basic claim that any product or service that can become a software product will become a software product. Because if it can become a software product, then it can replicate at scale and marginal cost goes to zero. And that's the key part, that ultimately marginal cost must become zero. So then the corollary to that is that any company in these product service markets must become a software company. And then ultimately, he said he has an extreme claim that in the long run, the best software company will win. Mark Andreessen views most of these product markets as natural monopolies. So why should we listen to Mark's opinions? Well, let's give you a bit of background. Um, Mark Andreessen is a software engineer who was the co-developer of the very first browser. He co-founded Netscape. He then became co-founder of LoudCloud a hosting business, which actually defined the term cloud, which ultimately got sold to HP for $1.6 billion. In 2009, um, he co-founded Andreessen Horowitz. And at Andreessen Horowitz, uh, they've invested in companies such as Facebook, Foursquare, GitHub, Pinterest, and Skype, just to name a few. He personally invested in Twitter and Quick. Quick was sold to Skype. So he's got skin in the game. So not only do you make the basic claims that he put forth in the Software It's the World article, but he then put his personal fortune and invested on others along that exact premise. But this brought him to writing the article in 2011. And the reason why he wrote the article was that he saw that most of the technology companies that he thought would travel along this path that he foresaw as being fundamentally misvalued by the market. Because at that stage, Apple, uh, Microsoft, etc., had P multiples that were the same as Exxon or GE or any of the industrials. And he thought that was a fundamental misreading of where things were heading. And we can see that today uh, in the second quarter of 2020, uh, the results from the FANG stocks are in and they've all exceeded earnings expectations um, even while this uh, current market collapse is underway or the economic collapse is underway. So now let's get to the heart of the question. Will software eat mining? Well. In his article, most of the examples um, were what uh, 
Clayton Christensen, another uh, great management theorist about disruption theory, would have actually called disruption. So the examples are Amazon eats borders, books, uh, Netflix ate blockbusters, yeah, distribution of video, uh, Apple ate CDs, so music distribution, Pixar ate animation, uh, Flickr ate Kodak, so digital photos versus printed photos. Uh, Facebook and Google ate advertising. So in all of those examples, they were classic new players coming in and disrupting the incumbents. Well, in his article, Mark Andreessen has a carve-out. And what he said is that in some industries, particularly those with heavy real-world components such as oil and gas, uh, the software revolution is primary an opportunity for incumbents. So what he's telegraphing here is he thinks the morphology of change is fundamentally different than those examples he gave in his article. But he couldn't actually articulate, he doesn't actually articulate what that might look like. So how might things actually transpire in mining? Well, maybe a bit of a clue might come from more recent examples than the ones given in the article. Uh, which have real-world physical components. And those examples, uh, the best known, is Uber and Airbnb. So what's going on here is that uh, the business model has been disaggregated. Uh, the ownership and the bits that can be turned to software have been separated. And the software bit has been allowed to scale. Uh, I won't go into you know, there's lots of parallels that doesn't match, but um, in essence, what we're looking at is uh, breaking things down so that uh, the software bits are able to scale at zero marginal cost, and that's the clue. And you can create these physical cyber uh, components that work in tandem. So we kind of get to the answer of this question, which is, yeah, kind of yes, software will eat mining, but probably not in the same way that Amazon ate books. Uh, it's kind of going to be in a bit more of a piecemeal fashion. So that's why I want to change the question now. Not will it, but how will software eat mining? And, you know, there's lots of debates about, you know, the order and the sequence and the morphology, but here's some clues as to what I look for. And I do expect some disagreement with this, so put all your comments below and, you know, happy to debate. So the first point I look at is a behavioral difference. Uh, I can spot when software is starting to eat a part of the value chain uh, when the basic sales and delivery model changes. So, uh, First of all, I will describe the traditional uh, model, which I call the traditional widget sales model. I will sell you a widget so that you can do some task to achieve some outcome. That is the traditional way of doing things. And each time the task is done, uh, it comes at some marginal cost. If you can aggregate all of that to together and actually just sell the outcome, generally through some form of automation, it becomes an as-a-service model. And the new as-a-service model goes slightly differently. I will sell you an outcome when you want it. And uh, this is uh, creates not only fundamental changes in behavior on the buy-sell interface, but also, once things are in operation, things change radically as well. So let's do a quick example. Um, so I'm going to touch on an area that I've uh, worked in, in my past. Uh, so this is uh, mine planning software. So I used to supply that uh, once upon a time. Uh, so the traditional and the sales model that I did employ uh, back in the day was I will sell you planning software so that you can plan operations for the next two weeks to provide guidance to operations. So that's, so you'd sell the widget and then the people, the planners, 
uh, have to gather all the data, put it into the software, um, you know, rough out how things would get done over the next couple of weeks. If if they were lucky, they could might have come up with some alternatives, but often just the one. Uh, and then once you found something that worked, you would take that to operations and communicate it. Now, if we live in a sort of software eats the world world, and let's say the situational awareness is already being provided as a service, so everything you need to know about the mine is already there and all accessible via, say, APIs, then the planning vendor would do something different. And now what I will do is I will sell you the best three alternative plans when something unexpected happens. And those plans will be delivered straight to operations. So basically I'm now an algorithm provider. Now the reason why I've used software in this case, I wanted just to show you that it isn't software per se that makes the difference. It's that zero marginal cost. So in the first instance, every plan comes at very high marginal cost and in the second instance what we're doing is setting up the situation so that um, plans can be provided at zero marginal cost and once they do they can be triggered off at any time and typically in this case the time you would want it is something has changed the shovels broken down or uh, the you know, you've had a big rainfall event or something, you know, anything that, that you didn't expect uh, that could influence uh, what's the best to do next. So that was a, an illustrative example. It's, it's probably small in the scheme of things and there's much bigger scope of things to, um, for software to eat. But now I'll get to the actual how. So if you take that example that was done in a particular way, notice that I said that you could do this mind planning or algorithmically, automatically. Uh, that now is the digital twin, but the digital twin was based on situational awareness, knowing exactly where you are and how you got there. So uh, that also kind of suggests how I think it's going to unfold or how the successful parts of the project will unfold. Each part of the, that is going to be eaten by software will probably go through that sequence. First of all, you have to have the situational awareness, the sensors and the data, and, and the accessibility of all of that data about everything that's going on necessary t for your digital twin to operate. Your digital twin then predicts the future or simulates the future, evaluates the future, and selects from potential futures uh, that you would like to proceed with and then uh, it will instruct the various equipment to do its job uh, in an automated fa fashion, you know, basically the actuation uh, of the equipment. And it is in running through that sequence in different parts of the value chain in no particular order that we're ultimately going to get to that zero entry mine. Uh, eventually the entirety of the mining value chain um, will uh, be eaten by software but this uh, is a much longer process than say Amazon eating books so we're not going to get that clean one hit it's going to be you know more like eating corn on the cob so now we come to the end of the exploration of this concept um, and I'm going to restate uh, Mark Andreessen's basic thesis, but now sort of contexted into mining. This is where we ended up. Component by component, the mining value chain will be transformed by software. Okay, most of us can imagine that, uh, although I'm sure there's some skeptics. The basic claim will be that any part of the mining value chain that can become software product will become a software product. That's that whole marginal key. Everything goes to this marginal cost of zero. So it isn't just software per se. It's that marginal cost part that's the important part. And then the next two are the same as before. Uh, to, to run these uh, processes, uh, you must be a software company, even if you're providing a physical element. Uh, and then in the long run, the best company uh, will win, natural monopoly. S still not 100% sure about his extreme claim. May or may not happen. Uh, you know, mining is a 
peculiar place so uh, there's you know there, there's often a need to you know make sure the market is at least an oligopoly okay thanks for everyone who's hung with me right to the end and in exploring software eats mining uh, thanks a lot uh, all the links to the articles uh, looked at uh, in this episode are in the text below uh, look forward to your feedback I learned a lot last time uh, even ended up with an addendum episode for the new things that came out so uh, look forward to that uh, if that happens again uh, I've planned out the next two episodes uh, the next one will be an interview uh, where we're looking at uh, implementation of uh, a big transformational projects uh, the same technology twice within the same company one a success one a failure so we can only really look at the cultural elements as to why what the differences were so I look forward to exploring that in some detail uh, then the episode after that uh, kind of brings things home a bit uh, where we look at incentives and where are the incentives to succeed and where are the incentives to fail and believe me they are incentives to fail uh, and uh, and hopefully then roll out after that what you might do about it not in that episode we're just going to mark out the territory of success and failure and where the incentives come from until next time see ya <laughs>